Welcome, welcome, welcome. Welcome to our Come Aboard the Pitch Deck. <laughs> We're going to wait for people to come in, get ready to go. But I am Shana Weber. I am a creative executive at ISA. And we are also with... Hi, I'm Caitlin Arcan Daniel. I'm the marketing manager at the ISA. Uh, and I also work on a lot of other marketing fun projects in the entertainment industry. Yay. So we are here today to introduce to you our pitch deck class. So the reason, first of all, why we are doing this class is because pitch decks in the world of TV and film is still a little bit of the wild, wild west. It's still kind of this unknown place of like, what do you need and what does it have to be? There's no real set rules yet. Um, and I think that one of the things that happens is you Google pitch deck, like what's a pitch deck? And you're going to get this information that's for investment opportunities for different businesses. So it's hard to figure out what exactly that means for screenwriters um, when you hear like you need a pitch deck. You're like, what is that? And how many pages? And I can't design that. I just want to be a writer. I don't want to do that. But guess what? You can. Because when I first did my pitch decks, I didn't know anything. And I just dove in and did it. And they're not that difficult. You can do it. You can also get help. So you don't have to do it yourself. But you can understand the fundamentals of making a pitch deck. And then you can go get help design what you need that. You can save your money and just make it yourself. The other thing about it is if you can't do it, do find somebody who can because the worst thing you can do is create a pitch deck that is not effective and then send it with your project and you kind of kill your first, your one shot at getting somebody to read your script. So with that being said, we're going to get started on talking about the who, what, when, where, why. Then we are going to go to the how with Caitlin. She is going to take us through a tutorial on Canva. Um, which is an amazing online program, free. You can get a paid version for, you know, bigger things. Um, and she's going to take you through building a pitch deck from the very beginning. So everybody is already kind of writing in the chat, like where you're from. I would encourage everyone to say, hey, where you're from, and we will get started. Okay, so the first thing is the what. What is a pitch deck? A pitch deck is a selling tool. It is a literal pitch. You are trying to pitch your project. If you're not verbally pitching it, you're creating a pitch deck, which is visually a representation of your story that you are trying to sell. That being said, it is not an information dump only. It is not a treatment. It is not a Bible. It is a visual representation to show tone, to show characters, and to give that information about your story so that somebody reads your script. I just want to make that really clear. This is so people get interested. If you make a boring pitch deck, it is not going to do the trick. So make it exciting, match the tone of your project. If you're writing a horror, make it dark, make it cool. You know, if you're making a comedy, make it light. If you're doing a TV series, give as much information as you need to give. Do not give too much. You are not putting your whole treatment, your whole Bible in this thing. So, okay. Um, also, it is using a mix of text and images to show somebody what you're trying to say. So thematically, tone-wise, that kind of thing. Um, it does not have to be dependent on fancy graphics. It does not have to be dependent on giving them your entire series of information about your about your TV show. Don't give everything away because you don't know who this is going to go to. Ultimately, you want this to be able to go out. And it, let's say you send it to a producer and then they're like, oh, this other person would like it. You just don't want to share everything, but you want to give enough information so that it's interesting and somebody wants to either call you, read your script, meet with you, all of that. So hello, everybody. Welcome from Virginia, California, all that. Um, okay, so next we're gonna move on to the where. Where did a pitch deck sort of like come into this world going, hey, you need a pitch deck. So like I said, it started with inve an investment tool for different businesses. It's also kind of a mix between that and um, a lookbook that directors make, which add, which is something that they would create to create color, co color schemes, 
um, images that match the tone, that kind of thing. So it's kind of like this mix of those two. You do not need as a screenwriter, you do not need to add investor information or you don't even have to add comps if you don't want to. You don't have to add how much money this is gonna make. You don't have to do that stuff. If you want to, you absolutely can. Like what I mentioned at the beginning is that this is kind of the Wild West. You can make it however you want. There are no rules that have to be. Um, and I'll preface this whole thing with that. This is just our opinions on pitch decks. It is subjective. Everything in this business is subjective. So if you have another idea, if you want to add pages, if you want to take things out, that is totally up to you and your project. So you should make your pitch deck what feels great for you and your project and whatever feedback you get from the people in your world. So again, yes, we come at this with that disclaimer that this is um, all subjective. Um, let's see, where does a pitch deck go? A pitch deck will go to producers, collaborators. It can go to actors. It can go to directors. It can go to anybody that you want to have eyes on your script. Um, the other one is when. This can be a tool that you send out before you meet with somebody. It can be a tool that you share after you have a meeting with somebody. This can be the first thing you send to someone trying to get interest in a verbal pitch meeting, or it can be sent after you give a verbal pitch where they say, do you have any materials? Do you have any supplementary stuff to, to share? Those are the two places. Again, it's the Wild West. You can share it whenever. Um, why? Because you want them to read your script, right? You want someone to read your script. You want someone to buy your script. You want to go make your movie. You want to go make your TV series. And with that, if you don't make it impactful, then it's not doing its job. So don't make it. Make one if it's going to be impactful and it's going to be an actual selling tool for you. Think of it as a way of getting your thoughts in line. I use a pitch deck for before I'm actually verbally pitching something because it helps me get all of my thoughts in like really succinct zones. So I know exactly what I'm talking about. If I'm talking about the synopsis, I have it in a much shorter, concise way of describing. If I'm talking about my characters, it's much more concise. Thematically, what am I trying to say? Why did I make this? Why did I write the script? What personally resonates with me in the script? What personal experience do I have? So those are the things that we're going to um, talk about when we look at an example pitch deck that Caitlin made. And then she, her muteness will end and she will start talking. Um, <laughs> I have a lot to say, I swear. <laughs> yes, she does. Okay, so let's pull up Caitlin. Caitlin made an amazing example pitch deck for us to look through for only murders in the building. So it's something that we thought most people know at least and can identify with. So it kind of makes it an easy all around look at a basic writer pitch deck. Um, yes, Sean is correct in the chat. He says, you don't need a financial breakdown. However, market value comparisons, sure. You can put those in if you have that, but if you have good information, put it in there. If you don't have good information, you don't need to put that in there. Um, okay, so the first thing you're gonna do in a pitch deck is your title page. This is great. We know the show, so we know the colors that she built into this, which um, they pop. You know that this has a kitschy feel. It has something that is bright and exciting and comedic. And Caitlin, feel free to jump in about why you chose the doors for the title page. Yeah, um, I'm actually going to go into that when I go into how I made the pitch deck. Okay. But um, before we go into that, I just want to say it's very easy. It makes it easier, the process, if you pick one reference image or something that really stands out to you as carrying the character or theme of your whole script. Um, so for this pitch deck, these doors were my main reference photo in making the rest of the deck. Yes. And with that being said, she also took the same colors throughout and the same fonts throughout. So it has a very cohesive feeling throughout the entire deck. So this is the title page. Title page, you obviously want your title. You can put, you want to put the writer information on there. She added a comedy murder mystery series, which is great. It gives you the information you need on that front page. It's dynamic and interesting. 
Um, and that's what you want for your title page. You can do a full page image if you want, if it's very clear and crisp and high res, um, if that resonates the most, if you've made a short film or something like that, and you actually have stills from your movie, you can use that just to make your title page pop, basically. So we're gonna go on to the next page. So this is something that when I make decks, I sometimes put my log line on the title page. I sometimes create a page. It just depends on what I'm doing. So as you can see, the background of her image is very clean and clear. It's bright. You can read the text. She has the log line as a title font, and then she has the body of, um, of this as a different font that's easier to read, that's simpler, that and it's short. So this is a perfect page. Um, we're not gonna worry so much about the text in, in this walkthrough of a deck, only because we'll talk about that when she's kind of building it out. But I would say overall, you want the least amount of words with the most impact versus doing an entire like two columns. Nobody wants to read anything. I hate to tell you that, but nobody wants to read. They want to look at a fun picture and they want to read a little bit. Okay. Next. Yep, next. Okay, so your synopsis page. She put an image behind, which is the building, and the crime scene do not cross. You get an instant tone of what this is. And the synopsis is in a block of color, so it's easy to read. The white versus the green. Super simple. Again, she used the same font for synopsis that she did for Logline that she did on the title. Um, and then the synopsis is short. I wanna reiterate this for everybody. Your synopsis on a deck does not have to be your one page synopsis that you write out. You want the most impactful amount of words on this. Nobody wants to read two pages of a synopsis on your deck. You can always send them your one sheet, your synopsis, all of that stuff. So really, really edit your deck. That's a huge part of it. For reference, this synopsis, when I put, since this is a show that already exists, there was a synopsis already existing for it. And this synopsis was probably a full page and a half worth of text. And then I cut it down to this small blurb and cut out anything that might be repetitive or redundant um, to get it to be this short. Yes, that is a very good point that Caitlin says. Um, you don't want any redundancies throughout your deck. Don't put things over and over. Like you don't need to put stuff that's in your synopsis, in your character description, or in your in whatever other pages. You want to be really specific and edit that down so that every page has new information. Next page. Okay, so this is the first of the character pages. Now, some people put in their deck like a spacer in between that says characters. You can totally do that. You don't need to do that, but that's an easy way. If you feel like it's busy and you kind of want a breather to kind of get into it, you can totally do that. You don't need to, it's an aesthetic thing. You can decide if you want to do that. So in this case, she didn't. She put the trio above Mabel's name, which totally works. It, it makes sense. And then what, what Caitlin did here in the character description, you'll see that this does not talk a lot about plot. It talks about who Mabel is as a person. And I want you guys to think of this part as if you are sending this to the actor that you want to be in this part. What will entice the actor? What character traits? What's this character's arc? What do they want? What are their flaws? Put those in the character section versus talking so much about plot or what they're doing. That is my suggestion. Um, in this case also, she has a picture of Selena Gomez who actually is the part. You can do a version of this where you put an action shot of someone in a situation. If it's a police detective, find a police detective picture, something that is familiar-ish, that they're active, and then you can put little squares at the bottom with with comps for actors that you would like. And that you can play with diversity. You can play with, you know, different things. Like if you're thinking, well, it would be good for this person, but it will also be good for this person. You can kind of put three of those on the page also, as long as it doesn't make it super messy. But you'll also see how simple and clean this is 
and you're focused on her and the words. Everything else adds a little bit of like a nuance to it, but it's not so busy that you're like, ah, overwhelmed. And she included the same thing she was talking about with the windows and the colors at the top. So it's very uniform. Is there anything you want to add, Caitlin, about this page? Yeah, I'll just say I'm going to go a little more into how to find royalty free photos and photos that are easy to use in these decks. But I would say writing the paragraph about the character is the best thing to do first, because then if you don't necessarily envision your character yet or have somebody in mind, you can use the adjectives you used in your paragraph to help find someone you're looking for. for so for someone like Mabel, after writing this paragraph, if I was going into a royalty free photo site, I'd probably type in things like um, trendy millennial, um, fashionable girl, girl in New York City, um, artist, things like that. So you can use the characteristics to find a photo that you're looking for. Okay. Um, I'm going to address a couple questions that have popped up here. So Sean is asking, why did you go for the characters before a look and feel page that represent the world? So it depends on the project. If you feel like the world is more important and that's the most interesting aspect of this, do that first. In this case of murder, Only Murders in the Building, the trio of characters and the story is huge. The dynamic between the three of them is huge. So for us and Caitlin, and I've looked at this afterwards, but I felt like this was the right order. I personally like to look and feel and after I get through the log line, the synopsis, and the characters, so that the person reading it understands. But I've also made pitch decks where you put the world first, where you're setting up a sci-fi world, and that's the first slide that you do after your title page. Whatever you feel is the best representation of your project, do it in that order. Again, we're only talking about subjectively, you know, project by project, but trust your own instinct in terms of like what you think goes first. Christine is saying, wait, someone, oh, Butterfly Beach Media says too many words on these slides. Could, should be four to five lines max. Yeah, depends on the project. If you, as long as it's legible and you can read it and every part is interesting, I don't mind this much for a character, to be honest with you. Um, if you want less, do less. I wouldn't do more, but I wouldn't necessarily, you know, say, oh, you only have to do four or five lines. Um, yeah, so it, again, it's totally up to you what you think is the best for your project. Um, and then Christine is asking, is it best to stay away from known actor images? I think that the best way to showcase what you're looking for is to put known actors. They don't have to be, they don't have to be Selena Gomez. They don't have to be, you know, Bill Murray or whoever a huge, huge actor is. You can do lesser known actors, but again, it depends on your project. If you're trying to write a big budget movie, you're probably gonna to wanna to put A-list actors in there, right? Because budgetarily you're thinking, this is a $50 million, $20 million movie, we can get this person. If you're going super independent, I would choose more independent actors, people that you think fit in this, that you wanna maybe give a leg up or are new or exciting. So again, that's up to you on which actors that you wanna put in. Caitlin, what are your thoughts on that? On, on finding, yeah. So I think overall, so I'm trying to think from this perspective, if I didn't know who already played this character, like I said, you can search different traits about her. Um, but I do think it's helpful, like you said, to put in actors that you envision the world because then that helps them for casting or envisioning who they could have attached to this project. Um, but I'm gonna go into the photos that exist in Canva. Um, and how to find your own. But overall, you can use, since pitch decks aren't being used to sell anything, like you're not selling a pitch deck, um, you can use photos of people, of real people and people that exist because it's not something you're selling. So it's kind of fair game to use photos in them of anyone that you want to put in there. Yeah, and you can also, there's some sites that Caitlin will go into that you can find those images, those still images that are high res from, TV and film that you can pull over. The What you don't want to do is use a low res picture that's fuzzy or anything that's not super clear. As you can tell from this picture, it's very clear and crisp and it looks very professional. So that's what you want. Okay, let's go to the next slide of the second part of the trio. Um, 
So obviously Martin Short is this character. But again, if you don't have one person in mind, you can do whatever kind of person that character is, a picture, you could just do description and do three pictures at the bottom of actors that you think fit this role. And again, like Caitlin said, use your description as that information, pull that information over. I love that in this description, she put character traits. He is lively and eccentric, constantly adding color colorful quips to conversation, but is sometimes held back by his inability to let go of the past. I mean, it's rich with information for that character and it and it doesn't give everything away, but it tells you enough about this person that makes you know that the writer has an arc and has interesting aspects about this character that they wanna share. Well, and I think about this specifically, the trio, because they're the main point of it, it's, it's you have to kind of convey how they're gonna interact with each other, which is right. why I put, as the last line of all of their pages, how they interact with other people or how other people perceive them so that you can kind of start to gauge the dynamic on how they're gonna work together. Mm -hmm. um, and then I also put on the bottom of all of these pages, um, three little items that either come up somewhere in the plot for them or are good representations of their personality to kind of start to build their world since their individual apartments are very much a character as well in this. So their three items are things that represent them and start to allow you to envision their world and their apartment and where they live. Right. Um, okay, let's go to the next page. So this is the third member of the trio. Again, you will see that all three of those pages are very uniform. They are the same. You get that they're a team of three. Um, again, she wrote the character things of how they relate to each other at the end, but tends to play it safe and is usually unwilling to take risks. Huge aspect of that character description is, is telling us how they're gonna play throughout. What are their flaws? What are they, you know, what, what problems are they gonna get mixed up with? So those are all good things to put in your characters. Um, in terms of how many characters to put in your pitch deck, for me, it, for a movie, I think three. If you're doing a series like this and you have three main characters, three pages for characters. You can also divide this up. If you have one main character and then you have supporting, you could do one page with one main character. The next page could be two supporting. You could do the main character and the main antagonist, then do a, then do a supporting page. Um, again, it's up to your discretion of what aesthetically you think is the most important. I would not do eight pages of characters. Even for a series, I would not do a whole ton of pages because it gets monotonous and again nobody wants to read anything they just want to like see a fun picture and keep scrolling i think that i read every page of this because to me it was interesting i think that that's the difference you can do three lines if you want about character sometimes that leaves somebody wanting more sometimes that's discouraging because they're looking at it and they're saying i want to know a little bit more again it's totally up to you it's up to your, you know, your vision and what you want. There are no rules. And I keep seeing on the side a few people saying, well, it has to be this, it has to be that. It doesn't. It doesn't have to be anything. It can be whatever you want it to be. Um, okay, next page. Yeah, so the next page is kind of going to show you how to use characters without having big descriptions, but to showcase other characters and other people within the world. Yes, I love this page because you understand exactly what you're looking at. You're looking at suspects you're looking at they're solving a murder mystery you you get the tone you get to see pictures of different people you know that it's complicated you know that there's a lot of suspects right you know that their minds are going deep into like how are these people connected so it makes it fun um caitlin do you want to talk anything else about why why you created this page like this yeah so um i created this page as a way to show because the Arconia and the residents of the Arconia are very much a character in itself. And I think the residents and the uniqueness of the residents in the variety of people that live in the building really contribute to the story. So what I wanted to show here is all the different types of people that you have in the building. You have a musician, um, you have a, a young man, you have the doorman, you have musician Sting for some reason. Um, and then also add in some little Easter eggs for the story of things that we mention in the um, the synopsis of the 
first episode that we'll get into. So things that come into play, like the emerald ring and the knitting needles in the bassoon cleaner. So everything on this page has a purpose. Everything on this page somehow ties in to the plot um, and where it's going to go to kind of build that world and give people kind of foreshadow what's to come um, in the plot, because all of these elements here come into play. Good. Um, I'm going to throw this question at you, Kaylin, because this is yeah. this is an interesting question. I want to see what you answer. Okay. Just curious, why did you pick this particular order for the characters in this sample deck? Um, for the for the order of the characters, yeah, why um, did you put her before the two of them? So I'm gonna be honest. That's the way they came up in my research. Um, <laughs> I did it. <laughs> that is the way they came up in my research. I find that if you've watched the whole series, all three seasons, um, the se the seasons vary with who is at the forefront of the plot and have different things going on in their life. I personally think. Other people might have different opinions on this, but I think personally with this show, each of those three characters is of the same importance and they all carry the same weight in the plot and the trajectory of the season. Um, so I think they're interchangeable in terms of the order. That's just the way they felt in this particular deck. Yeah. And again, it's if you're doing a, something where there's a trio of characters, I think it's just up to you to decide who is who's your who's your main character and then who are you know, every story has one main character, like she just said. So in the first in the first season, it was about her story because she was the most knowledgeable about what really was going on and had the most backstory concerning that. Um, uh, somebody asked if you can include side characters or just the main characters. You can include side characters, but again, what you don't want to do is do eight pages of characters. So try to keep it slim and use one page for a couple characters. If you feel like you have one or two lines about them, but you don't want to go into more detail about them, or you don't want to put pictures of actors. You just want to put one picture of, you know, I was just going to say Sting, but he would probably be a main character in, if you were just doing one. Um, that was the only person I can think of because it's Sting. I mean, come on. Okay, so let's go to the next slide. I just have one more thing to say about the order. Um, you'll see this when I go in Canva, but it's very easy to interchange the order of pages within Canva. So if it's something like, you can change it around depending on who you're sending this pitch deck to. So for example, if you're pitching to somebody who's a younger crowd um, and might resonate more with a younger character like Mabel, you could move her to the front. Or if, it, if you're pitching to somebody that you think might resonate more with Oliver um, or Charles, you can always interchange them. It's very easy in this format to interchange the pages depending on who you're sending it to. Right. Um, someone's asking in a non-murder mystery, what would this page after the main characters be? Supporting actors, antagonists? Yes, yes. If you're already through your characters, you can move on to the next slide. It doesn't have to be anything. It can, you can just move on to a location, which I think the next page for this one is, or the world, or whatever you feel like is next most important after the characters. So let's move on to the next slide. So this is a page that we're calling the, is it the Arconia? Is that the, okay. So the Arconia, this can be a page for locations. This could be a page for setting. This could be a page, anything you want. If there, this in, this particular one, there is a location that we know, the Arconia. It is the building. It is another character in this story. It is important. Um, so this is where you would put that next thing of like, if you if the world is not the main thing, if it's not a sci-fi or something where you need to set up this world, that this is where you could put the setting page and talk a little bit about it and how it resonates to the story. So She's saying, you know, in this description, our story takes place within the grand, grand archways of an affluent Upper West Side apartment building, the Arconia. From a lonely cat lover to music legend Sting, the residents of the building have no shortage of drama contributing to the chaotic twists and turns of the ongoing murder investigation. And she put little pictures of the interior on there, which um, just kind of adds to it. They're, they're small, but again, like you know what the inside of a building looks like. So they're just adding a little bit of fun elements to that and creating just a little bit more depth um, into the story. Yeah, so this image actually, um, this one here on the side, is from the original um, envisioning of of the set in the Arconia. Um, so this this image came from when they were envisioning the environment. Um, so if you don't already have 
obviously this is an environment that already exists because the show already runs. But if you have an environment in mind, you can search things like um, upscale apartment building in New York or Regal Archway, things like that, um, to really try to embody the vibe um, of where these characters live. Yeah, and if you're doing, let's say, like a zombie movie and you you could find some sort of a, a sweeping big photo of, you know, like a apocalyptic road or a town or whatever you want to use for that, you could, on this page, you could use a couple images and put them on in a, in a lovely format. Um, so again, there's no hard rules um, to, to a setting or location page. It's up to you and what, what you think aesthetically works best for your project. If you have multiple locations, like say your movie set in a dilapidated warehouse and then go somewhere else, you could do two pages. You could do warehouse and another page for wherever it is. Um, just show dynamically the most important aspects that are interesting that somebody's going to go, oh, that's cool. Or, wow, I'd like to see more of that. That resonates with me. You're trying to evoke an emotion out of the person looking at this. That is the most important thing. Just like in a verbal pitch, you want to leave the lasting impression. This is the same thing. You want somebody to look at this and get an idea in their head of what your story is and be excited about it so that then they want to read it or share this, move it forward in the process of buying your project. So let's move on to the next page. Okay, so in a series, this would be where you would put your pilot, and in this case, episode one, which is fun that she used an elevator because it has the numbers, it's very cute. So your episode one pilot is, it depends. It's different than your synopsis because your synopsis is a big overview. And then your ep this pilot page, episode one page, is more detailed in terms of what happens in your pilot. If you're gonna do a series Bible, in my opinion, this is the page that has the most information out of the entire deck is this pilot episode because you're saving this person a lot of time reading the pilot all the way through. You're giving them the great, you know, Wikipedia short version of it that adds this flavor of mystery or um, enticement to read the project. What do you think, Caitlin? Anything else you want to add on the pilot page? I like how you highlighted certain words. What was that about? Yeah. So, um, I picked the elevator because that is where the trio meets for the first time. Mm -hmm. um, and it's very early on in the pilot episode. So this kind of sets the tone in the environment. Um, also, I just thought it was a really fun visual. Um, but I, the parts I highlighted were the first parts of Charles, Oliver, and Mabel meeting for the first time. Um, so where they come together. And then I highlighted the podcast called Only Murders in the Building because that's kind of the vehicle that goes throughout the entire series of the platform that they use to solve these murders. Um, so I highlighted those. Obviously, if somebody else went through this, they might choose other different parts to highlight. I think highlighting important parts adds a little bit of um, visual texture and interest when you're looking at a body of text that's this large. Um, so that's why I tend to, I use this in a lot of marketing or presentational things is to highlight key elements um, so that if people are skimming or they not reading the whole thing, their eye is at least drawn to the most important parts of the text. Awesome. Okay, let's move on to the next page. And this is a page that it's up to you again, but for me personally, and obviously for Caitlin, you don't have to give away every single bit of information about every episode. If you have that mapped out in a Bible, you don't have to give everything away. You can give a small overview of what happens. You don't even have to do this. You could just do one page of like season one overview and write a paragraph. You don't have to break it down by episode. If you can do that, you can do that. But don't give away every single detail about every episode. That's just my opinion. You can if you want if you really want that on there, but it's a lot of text, a lot of copy to read, and you don't know where this is gonna be shared. And so I would just say exercise on the side of caution. So did I say that right? That sounded really weird. Um, so <laughs> you know, I say sometimes phrases weird and then I'm like, oh, that was silly. Um, but yeah, less is more, I think on this. 
yeah, this actually doesn't even have um, all of the episodes. I believe there were 10. Mm -hmm. Don't quote me on that. But there were more than seven episodes for the first season. Um, but for the sake of keeping this short and concise, I did do the first seven. And I actually, this background is from, it's a blown up from this. So I carried it right in episode one to the rest. Uh, same background. So it was all cohesive. Right. And if you are doing a film, you don't need this page or the pilot page. You can just make this deck shorter. Series Bibles tend to be a few pages longer than a film deck. So don't worry about that. You need something to fill into these pages. You don't. This is just series because you're trying to get that information out there. Um, and yes, Andrea, in a series Bible, that's where you would put more information because that's something that you're actually going to share with the producer or executive or person who's going to buy this and then you have that trail that you sent that Bible to them with all of your more dense information. This is a visual pitching tool. And yes, Seth, a pitch deck is with too much text is like handing someone a 150 page screenplay. That is very true. Yes, don't do it. <laughs> okay, so let's move on to the next slide. Okay, this, this page is to me and to ISA a very important page. You have to say something about why you wrote this, why it matters now, and how you are connected to this piece. What personally either made you write this? How are you personally invested? Why are you the person to write this series? Be um, on staff of writing this series if you sell it. You really want to put your connection to the project on some page, and it's generally at the end of the deck. Um, really dive deep into yourself and find those things that resonate. Again, this is one of your last pages. This is where sometimes people go just to find out about you. You don't have to put a bio in here. If you want to put a writer bio, that's totally fine. But to me, this is one of the most important pages of a deck is your statement, why you wrote this and why it matters. And this, this copy um, is actually from an interview with John Hoffman, one of the creators. Um, so that's where this is from. If you're, if you're reading this and using it as, as an example, obviously this is not exactly what you would write. You would write a little bit more about your inspiration behind creating it. Um, but I use this quote specifically because it talks about uh, the core of the show and how they hope it impacts their audience. Right. And so as we move on, I know people are asking like, what program? We're going to move over to the how with Caitlin in a second. She's going to go through Canva and just talk through how to set this up and build it. That being said, let's go to the last page and then we're going to move on to part two. So you always want a contact page on your deck. Don't leave us hanging. If this gets sent to somewhere and then sent somewhere else, you always want your information on there so that somebody can find you. Um, obviously, your email and a phone number. We know in this world, nobody wants to use the phone anymore. So always make sure you have a working email on there. If you have a website, you can put it on there. Um, if you have writing partners, yes, put those on there. Like this one would say Steve Hoffman and Steve Martin or John Hoffman and Steve Martin. But always just make sure you end it with a contact page. Um, I did a deck where it was an animated series and we had room and we wanted to add a bunch of kitschy stuff so we put a just like an extra like epilogue page after contact us that was just images that was just for fun so again you can do whatever you want to do in terms of design like format just make sure that every page matters um i've seen decks that are 26 pages and effective i've seen decks that are eight pages and effective so use your discretion cut whatever out that you don't need have people look at it, give their honest opinions. You will do just fine. Okay, so we are now going to move over to the how part, and I'm going to turn it over to Caitlin, who's going to take you through Canva and setting up. Um, if you have questions, make sure you write them. We're going to go to those at the end and try to go through as many as we can. Also, we are considering adding some next classes we're just not sure about exactly the size of those and what they'll entail. So if you are interested in a more in-depth class on pitch decks, if you want one-on-one -on -one classes, if you want small groups of three to five, if you want to bring your work and see how it resonates or learn some tips and tricks, shoot us an email. 
either Kaylin or me or both and let us know your interest. And then that way we can start setting up sort of the next classes that we're doing. We just don't know kind of what you guys need. So do that. Um, before you move on to the how, uh, I think it's Martine is asking, do we want to include any comps? You can absolutely do a comps page, especially if you're doing like a horror film or something that you know it's like this, this, or this. Um, just make sure for comps you use things that are successful. Don't use something that didn't make any money or is a totally independent movie that nobody saw. Always use a comp so that somebody goes, yep, I know that one. Yep, I know that one. Yep, I know that one. And if they don't, they can look them up and see that they made money, that they made a profit. So that's the only thing with comps. Okay, Caitlin, take it away. Okay, um, so welcome to Canva. Um, I could literally teach about Canva for hours and hours. There are so many things within here to use. Um, but for the sake of this class, like Shana said, if you are interested in knowing um, how to use it more in depth or to go through your project specifically, let us know. Um, but for this class, I'm going to go through the basic entry level um, rules and features um, that can help you make this deck. Um, so in just for the sake of transparency, I do have a pro Canva account. Um, I believe it's like $12.99 a month, but yeah. I have a pro Canva account because I use Canva and it's full capacity every single day. I always have Canva tab open. I'm always using it. But if you're not always using Canva like I am, um, the free version has still has a ton of features you can use and you can cancel anytime. So it's kind of a thing where like if you want to have the pro version for creating your pitch deck or whatever, you can do that and then cancel it. Um, but just to show you so that you can see anything that has, um, while well, I click through these features, anything that has the little crown next to it is going to be a premium feature. So if you see me use something, um, I probably won't use magic switch, but if I use something like background to remove or something like that, and it has the little crown next to it, that's just so that you can know that it is a premium feature. Um, but I will go to the main page of Canva just to show you how to get started. So this is what you're first going to see when you enter Canva. It's very easy to create an account. You can just log in with your Google account or you can create one with an email address. And the front page of Canva has basically all of the things you can do. So they have all these different options for you. You can do docs, whiteboards, presentations, Instagram posts, all sorts of things. Um, but for something like a pitch deck or really any kind of presentational tool, I usually use their presentation 16 by nine format. Um, so to get to that, you're just gonna go in the right top right corner, click create a design and go down to presentation. Um, this presentation format does seamlessly go into things like um, Google Sheets uh, or PowerPoint. That's why I tend to use it for things that are presentation based. So once you click that, it'll open you to a blank canvas. Um, so for the sake of this class, I'm going to teach fully using the document that we already have so that you can see all these things. Um, so first things first, like Shana said, everything in this deck is very cohesive and matches. When you're making something like a pitch deck, you kind of want to treat your film or your TV show like a brand. And so when you're building this pitch deck, you're essentially building a brand and you want to keep everything on brand. So what I do before I create anything like this is I usually create myself a little style guide. Here's an example of what it looks like. And what I do is I basically take one reference image. So for this project, my reference images were, were these doors and then also these um, colored lines that they have in the promotional uh, pictures for this series. So if you're obviously this is a series that already exists, but if when you're doing it for your own projects, you can find some kind of image or similar object that you think fully encapsulates the vibe that you're going for in your project and then build off of that for the rest of the deck. So what I did here was I took this image of the doors and I built a color palette based off of that. So the first row I have are our main colors, which I took directly from the door. 
Um, and Canva makes it very easy to choose colors because basically what happens is if you click something, so if I click this circle and I wanna change the color of it, I just go right up here to the color and it actually will show me every single color that is on the document currently. And that's not just this page, this is the entire document. So any color that shows up in any of these slides will show up right here, which is super convenient so that you don't have to be guessing and trying to color match. Um, but if for some reason you need a specific color that's not showing up here, what you can do is click this rainbow button right here to add a new color. And if you know the color number, if you're working with Pantone colors or something like that, you can type it in here, or you can use this color dropper tool where you just click it and hover over whatever color you want. So say I want to exactly match this red door. I just click on the red door. It makes the color for me. And then I have the number right here for that color. So um, if I ever need this color again, if I just click it, open this, it'll show me the number and I can copy and paste it into any, any of these. Um, it's also really helpful to use their brand kit. So this brand kit over here, you can see I even created one for my wedding uh, and I have one for ISA. And it's basically giving you a color palette that exists there all the time. So if I'm ever making something for ISA or when I was making things for my wedding, I can go back and know that these are the color palettes that I'm working with. Um, and I can always draw these colors. And to do that, you would just go, so we're just under colors. I selected something with a color and then under brand kit, edit and I can add a palette and then I can just drag colors in. So if I'm adding to this one, can add a color, I can just type in the number of the color I want and there it is, it's in your palette. Um, so that's a really great tool that Canva has for you to be able to stay on brand and use the same colors throughout. Um, also, like Shana said, uh, we kept the text consistent. So rule of thumb typically is to choose two different text formats. So one, that's like a title text, something that's a little more flashy or eye-catching, fun-looking. Uh, for this one, I went based off of the logo. So I found a similar text to the logo for this show. Um, but also what you can do if you don't have something in mind is if you go over to the text on the left-hand side, they actually have a bunch of suggestions for you. So there's a bunch of um, templates and suggestions for fonts. And you can also type in things like if I'm doing, um, not murder, <laughs> uh, I'll type that in into the element section. But if I want like a basic font, it'll, it'll bring up fonts for me to use. Um, and also you can also import your own fonts if you have a font that you bought or created for your project specifically. If you just go under uploads, you can just upload the font right there and it'll, it will be there for you to use. Um, so what I did was I chose this text. And if you click on it, you see all the options. So I chose this specific text because it matched um, the vibe and, and the feel and the logo for my title text. And then I chose this more basic kind of corporate, easy to read text for the rest of the body. Um, because what can happen is if I had a full paragraph in this in this title text, it would be a lot. It'd be a lot to look at. It'd be a lot to read. Uh, so we do that as the title and then have something a little more streamlined, easy to read as the rest of it. Um, and there's also a bunch of things you can do to alter the text on Canva. So when you choose a text, um, not only do you have the regular bold italics underside, um, underline, you also can add different effects to it. Um, so the effect that I use most often and use throughout the deck was this lift one. So when you click it, um, you can decide how intense you want it. It just adds a little more, it adds a shadow to it basically. So it adds a little more depth to your pres to the text on the slides. So for something like this slide, it just has the text pop out a little more. But if you're going to use effects, make sure you stick with the same effects so that you don't have something that looks, that has a shadow. Uh, so you don't have something like this next to something like this and they look completely different. So for the entirety of this presentation, I used these two texts with 
the lift effect at 100% intensity. Um, I will also talk about these two links right here. I just put them on the screen in case people want to use them. Those are two of the best places to find royalty free photos. Um, so those photos, even though you're not selling this deck, so you, you don't need something that's um, approved for sale. These photos are fair game free to use at any time. Um, and Canva also <laughs> under elements has a very large library of photos. I believe they actually do source some of their photos from Unsplash and Pexels. Yeah. So yeah, so you can find, there might be some overlap. So if you're using those two sites, you can also probably search it in Canva and find a similar thing to it. Yeah, you can also look on Shutterstock sometimes if you're looking for something that's just a little more stock photo-y. Um, Shot Deck is also another place to go if you're looking for a still from a TV show and a movie. They're building their database all the time, so new stuff is coming in. And it's a great place to just put in what like action, and they'll pull up just a ton. So Shot Deck is a really great place. I believe you have to pay for it, but you can pay for it monthly, so you can do it one time to build your deck and then unsubscribe to it. So. Um, it's pretty reasonable. I think it's like $10 to get it for a month, but it's a really, really good place to find those high res, um, stills. Yep. And the way to get those in, if you download something on your own, not within Canva, everything you need to use on here is in this, um, left-hand panel. So if you just go to uploads, this is where all your images are going to live. So, um, if you, all you do is you click upload you upload your files and then they are here for you to use. And Canva will take a lot of different image files. They'll take JPEG, PNG, um, they'll even take vector files. Um, so anything you drop in here usually works if it's an image file. And then what you can do is just drag it onto your document um, and use it as you want. There's also duplicating features if you need to duplicate um, and can delete it also using that. Um, so going back to, um, getting here. So for these images here, these are images that I did find, um, on Canva under elements. So for something like the paintbrushes, you just type in what you're looking for and it comes up and they have, so they have different categories you can use. Graphics are going to be exactly what it says, graphics. Uh, so these aren't real life photos. These are either drawings or paintings uh, of what you're looking for. For this deck specifically, I was going for realistic items. So I would want to go under photos. Um, and this particular photo is this one right here. Um, so this one doesn't have a background. So it was very easy for me to just drag on here. Um, but for something like, I believe the skirt. Yep, here it is. So this is the image I used for the plaid skirt. Pull it up big for you. And if you don't want this floor background behind it, all you have to do is click edit photo, background remover, and it removes the background for you. And then you can move it however you want. That's one of the best features of Canva. Honestly, I use it all the time. Uh, it's very convenient if you're if you're trying to not clash backgrounds. Um, and within this editing speed over here, you can also change the color of literally anything. So I actually did it for these headphones. I'll show you how to do it on this skirt. So if you're trying, say you had this skirt and it, you wanted it to match this red banner, but it has all these brown tones in it, what you can do is under um, FX effects, you can just go to duo tone, click, if one of these fit, great. If not, you can go to custom and then just type in the color code for what you want it to match. And it turns it that color. Um, obviously this looks a little bit crazy. looks a little like neon, but if you do want to, that's exactly what I did for these headphones. Um, these headphones were blue to begin and I turned them maroon to, to fit into the slide better. 
Shana, are there any questions? I just had a lot of information go out. So are there any questions on what I've done so far? I'm gonna answer every question that we have come up here. I'm gonna answer them in at the end. Let's just okay, perfect. keep going. But again, put your questions in because we're gonna pull them over and just go through all of them. So don't feel like we're not answering you at this point. I am looking at all of them. Scott is pulling them over. We, we will get to your questions, I promise, I promise. Yes. Um, another helpful tool that I can show you by going to this page right here. Um, so when you have a page that is very filled with items, all, so everything on this page is a separate item. So even these tape strips are a separate item. So something like this can get kind of frustrating if you're trying to move stuff and you're accidentally moving the wrong things. A great thing you can do is actually lock images. So say I do not want this strip of tape to move no matter what I do to this image here. I can just click this little lock position and it's locked. So whatever I do with this photo, that piece of tape is not going to move. Uh, and to unlock it, it's very easy. You just click it and click lock and then unlock. And it's free. Yeah, that's really yeah. important if you like if you're trying to move stuff around, but you don't quite know, but you know one thing needs to stay in the middle or you're moving text and you're not sure and you keep like, ah, oh, no, it's moving that thing and I want it back in the spot. You can just lock it in place and then you can play. And again, like with this page, if you're new to pitch decks, you don't need to go to this much detail. You can do a simpler version of this and it will be as effective. Once you start playing with Canva, the great thing about it is you learn new parts. Like I'm, I'm learning new things as I'm listening to Caitlin and I'm like, oh yeah, I didn't know that they had, but I didn't know that they added the drop feature for color that you could let oh. go. I didn't know that. And so we've been like, you know, sometimes struggling to find the perfect color. So the more you play with Canva, the more that you're going to get comfortable with trying new things. And so that's kind of the fun of this. Make it fun and not such a torture. It's not like writing a synopsis or a Bible where you're like, oh my God, it's the, oh, it's the worst part of it. This can be really fun and it actually helps you put your thoughts together if you are going out and verbally pitching. It really does help you cohesively sort of like get all your ducks in a row. So have fun. Yeah, this this deck was really not just because I love the show. Obviously, I'm biased because I love the show, but it really helped remind me of what happened in season one because mm -hmm. that's so long ago now. I just finished season three. So going back through this, I was like, oh, yeah, that plot point and this by finding all these little items. Um, well, JJ's asking, can you group two items like the tape and the photo? Can you show them how to group? Yes, of course you can. My other favorite thing to do on here. OK, so let me use something that is easy to grab. All right, we're gonna do this little photo of Tina Fey down here or Cinda Canning as she is in the show. So everything in this section is a separate item. So her photo is a separate item. The frame behind it is a separate item. The pin is a separate item. So what you wanna do, an easy way to do this if you don't have a lot of things on the page. So I'll show you something that doesn't have a lot of things on the page like this page. So if it's a mini more minimalist page and you only have a few things, this is separate from this. So I can show you with this. What you can just do is just literally drag right over it. So now we have selected the background. We have selected the tape. And you have this little menu that came up. So you're just going to click more. Um, for some reason, it does not want us to group those. Let me see. Oh, there we go. Okay. So to get, I'll show you this way instead. Don't do that way. Uh, what you're going to do is you're going to hold down the shift button on your keyboard. You can't see my hands, but I promise I'm pressing the shift key. And you're just going to click everything that you want in the group. So I want this background. I want this tape. And I'm going to click group. And now these are one. They move as one. And to ungroup them, you just click on it and click ungroup. Sometimes it sticks, so sometimes you have to like wiggle it. But like, yes. yeah, you got to click outside of outside of the box. Now they're separate. Um, so if, if it doesn't un, unstick at first, just click outside of the box. So for something like this page, that's a little crazier. Um, hold down the shift key, click the photo, the background, the pin. Doesn't want us to do those either. <laughs> That's so weird. I wonder why it doesn't want us to group these. Okay, let me try uh, these. 
So these are already grouped right now, this text. So I'll show you, click that, click that. Canva hates this class right now. <laughs> Why? Oh, there we go. Group. Okay. <laughs> and now they move as one. So generally the rule of thumb, hold down shift, click what you want, click group. Um, and for something like this page, that's a lot easier because I use Canva a lot. So I actually didn't group most of the stuff on here. So a lot of this stuff can move. Um, but it's a good thing to do like these buildings. So I actually created these all individually. Every single one of these was a different thing. And then I grouped them together. So now they can move, move as one. Um, and so I was able to move them all from page to page just by copying the group um, and then moving it to a new page. And if, if you're doing something like these three slides that look almost identical, um, if you just hover over the page, so page four, and then click the three dots, you can just duplicate the page. So it'll be the exact same page, and then you can um, move what you want in there. So I can just move another photo, and it'll only edit the duplicate page. So that's what I did for these three, since they were all relatively the same. Right. So if you're creating a deck and you know you want you know, your backgrounds to be all, maybe you have a texture or maybe there's some like very specific background that you like. You can just make all your pages with that. Duplicate, 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 and then build on this. Yeah. So you'll notice through this, if there wasn't um, a specific background to use, like this is pretty much the exact screen of the way their podcast shows up to people. Um, and I use this photo right here as inspiration. Um, if it's not something like that or like this where it's an elevator, all of the rest of the pages have black backgrounds so that they're all cohesive. Um, and you usually want to decide if you're going to go for a lighter look or a darker look um, so that you're not interchanging between white backgrounds and black backgrounds and red backgrounds. Um, so for this, I went for a little more a darker feel, but with fun pops of color. So everything is black with the pops of color on it like these banners. Right. And if you are more fancy and you have Photoshop skills and you want to build your image in Photoshop and create, you know, whatever around it or with it or put two pictures together or create some fun thing, you can always save that image, pull it into Canva, put it into your document and then do your text. You can totally do that. You can cross jump just as long as you're saving your image in here. You can pull it in. Oh, yeah. And Canva actually has a lot of cool. So I can use this elevator photo for reference. So this elevator photo um, actually had other numbers on it when I pulled it in here. Um, but now Canva has a tool where if you click it and edit the photo, you can use this thing called grab text. Um, and it'll see, here's all the regular numbers that used to be on it. Um, so when you use that, it essentially grabs all of the text off the photo and changes it into editable text. So, um, I did not know that. Yeah, that's brand new. That's like brand new. So I'll show you what it originally looked like. Here is the original. Um, I'll put it on another page so you can see. Here's the original uh, elevator. So what I did to this was I edited, grabbed all the text, I will say it's not a perfect science with coding the text and what the font is uh, because a lot of these fonts don't normally live in Canva. So like you'll see that it changed this to kind of a, a wonky text that I wouldn't want to use, um, but it makes it so that you can remove the text um, and create whatever you want on there. That's so that's really, that's really fun to do if you're grabbing something um, that has text on it. So I'll go back. So I matched, you don't have to go this in depth, obviously. I just wanted everything to match uh, the text that I had. And I also wanted to be able to do my own things in there. So I added that. Um, and another thing I'll say is that I, th I think I said before, so when you're looking for elements for stuff, um, if you're going to go for realistic looking items, stick with realistic items. If you're going to go with animated or, um, drawn images stick with drawn images so everything on here like this is a realistic blueprint these are realistic pins 
Um, but if I was going with something more cartoony, I would go with something like this. Um, just make sure you stick with the same, uh, whatever you choose, either realistic or animated, stick with it throughout the entire, entire thing. Right. Unless stylistically you have something like you have a really cool storyboard that you want to include in there. That's some like action thing or something. Just make sure you're titling it appropriately so that they understand that that's a storyboard. Or if you have an animation of something that you want to build, I don't know if there's a doll in it or something. And so you have like a cool animated version of that. You can just label it so that the person knows what you're talking about and they're not confused that this is a mix between animation and, um, you know, it's not the aha video. It's not like it's live action mixed with a drawing that comes to life. If that's the case, then you want to just clearly state that's what you're doing. Yeah. Yeah. And um, like Shana has said at the beginning, everything in this deck has a purpose. So um, going from an easy way to find other items. So I actually just made these two pages uh, probably like two hours ago. Um, so when in thinking what to put on these pages, I went back to the episode description um, mm -hmm. and I thought, hmm, what is in here? What's an item that I can include? Um, so I thought I was thinking about the, the podcast. So the podcast fans we have here, we have the Arconia. And then also the fact that in the episodes, they find a package addressed to the murder victim. So I went with the imagery of the package room uh, and finding finding the package. Uh, same thing with this slide, everything on here is an element from the script. So having those descriptions to use first is a really good way to find your imagery so that you can literally just pull out exact, exact phrases and things that they're talking about. Cause like right here, a package addressed to him, engagement ring. Here's the package and there's the engagement ring. Um, yes, yeah, so a good way also if you if you're starting this and you're not sure where to start, obviously the title page is probably the easiest and never feel like you have to keep something. So if you build it and you have a title page and you're like, "Oh, you know what? I think something else might work." Write your text out, figure out what you're putting in your copy of this, pull that in first and build around it. See if it fits on the page. See if you need to edit it down. See how big it looks. Do that, and then you can sort of build stuff. If you love an image, put the image on the page first and then see how much room you have to add your text. And if you need to cut it down so that it looks better, do that. Um, if for some reason your synopsis is long and you want to put a big picture, put a big picture at the top, start your synopsis, and add a page two for that. There's no rules. Again, it's just whatever you think is most effective and looks the best for your story. What you don't want to do is cram everything onto a page where it's really, really tiny and no one can read it. You know or take, do an image that's really small so you fit your text. It's like, just take a breath and make it make it so it's easily readable and enjoying and enjoyable to look at. Yeah, for the order of making this, there is absolutely no rule. So I will say this, I actually did this title page last. This was the last page I made. Um, so while I had the doors as my main first reference image, I wasn't, I had the color palette, I had the fonts, but I wasn't quite sure how I wanted this page to look. I didn't know if I wanted it to be full of doors um, or have the doors as just a small part and then another visual. So I kind of, I did the rest of the deck and then I felt the vibe of it was like, okay, this is what works. So this deck, I probably redid four or five times before sending it to you, Shana. Um, I just, I kept changing things around this log line page. I also, it was one of the last pages I did um, because I just, I couldn't figure out what I wanted there. But then once I, I came across that podcast image, so right mm -hmm. here, it was like, oh, that's, that's absolutely what I'm doing. So um, don't feel bad if you don't know exactly what you want as your cover page yet, because this was absolutely not the cover page when I began this. Yeah. And that's the great thing about creating your own is that if you make your own, you can edit it anytime you want. Mm -hmm. You want to change your actors out because you want to send it to somebody specifically that you know has worked with a certain actor. Do that. Make a duplicate. Put in a new picture. That's the wonderful thing that when you build your own, you get to do that versus hiring a designer and then having to reach out to them and pay more money in order to have them change it for you. If you do hire somebody, 
I would make it so they send you the files so that you can go in and change it. Yeah, I was just going to say that. So um, for quite a few of the clients I work with, they, when I do their work, I know that I'm providing them a Canva file. Um, so even if I didn't fully make it in Canva, I put it in Canva for them so that they can edit it if they need to do small edits. So that's definitely something you can ask for. If it's just something small, like um, the way that this is written, or you want to change the log line or something, what they can do is they can lock a bunch of the design elements um, so that you're not like moving around a bunch of stuff. And then you can just go in and make the small changes on it. Right. Um, and I'll just show you how you can move stuff around um, in these last few minutes. I'll finish with showing you how you can move stuff and make copies. Um, so like I said, it's super easy to change the order of slides. So they're all here on the bottom. And all you have to do is just move it where you want it. So if I don't want Mabel to be the main slide, I want her to be last, I just move it over. Um, that's all you have to do. Super easy. And I showed you this before. Uh, you can even hide a page if you if you don't want it to be in the presentation. So it'll show up when you're editing it, but it won't show up um, in the presentation. Uh, so you can do that if you have a page that's maybe a work in progress. Like I said, you can also duplicate pages um, to make it a copy of the exact same thing. Now to make a copy of the whole document, is super easy. I actually did it for this class. So um, under, I sent Shana a copy of this under my projects. So I have the uh, Only Murders in the Building pitch deck. And then I actually have this teaching copy right here that so that I could mess with it without messing with the actual copy of it. Um, so to do that, you just click file, make a copy. Um, and it makes an exact copy of it. And it'll just be called copy of only murders in the building pitch deck. Um, and you can just by clicking on it, you can change that. Um, you can also resize documents. Um, it's now, so I don't think this will happen in this case of making a pitch deck into Instagram format, but you never know, just in case. Um, if you click magic switch up here, um, this used to be called resize. So for any reason, if you have an outdated form of Canva, though, I don't think you should, if for any reason it used to be called resize. So you'll either see magic switch or resize up here. Um, and you can resize it to whatever you want. So these are the three I use most often. So that's why they're showing up here, but you can also do a custom size. So if I do Instagram post, um, square continue, it's going to show me a preview, um, of what, what it looks like and then you copy and resize it. So it'll copy it and then I can open the new document. Obviously it's not gonna be perfect because it wasn't made for this size, but it will put everything, all the elements that you have on the pages already. So then you just need to go in, resize them. Um, and then the last thing is just when you go to save your copy. Um, so Canva saves automatically. So you do not have to do anything to save your projects in Canva. They will always save in the state that they are in. If for some reason uh, you accidentally delete something or really mess it up and you don't know how to get back, um, you can go under file version history and it'll show you all the versions um, mm. that you've had within the day and you can restore them. I have had to use this a few times if there were things that I messed up or redid uh, and didn't mean to. It will save them all, um, depending how many times. I think it'll only do up to how many? One, two, three, four, six. Um, so if it's something you haven't edited in a while and you've only auto saved like once or twice, it'll show the last date, even if it was a month ago. But since this deck has been edited a lot, these are the most recent auto saves. Um, so I can go back to what it was like at 236 and restore that version. And then to save your document, um, obviously it's saved within Canva, but if you want it to share with people, you just go to share, um, and then you go to download. And for something like this, um, Shana, would you say PDF? Yeah, PDF. PDF is pretty standard for how you would save this and the easiest way for people to open it. Okay. That's what I figured. So there's two versions of PDF here. I, if you're sending it virtually, 
I recommend doing PDF standard mm -hmm. um, because PDF prints, I used to do it because I was like, oh, it's going to look so good. It's going to be so fancy. But a lot of places, it is too big. The file is far too big to be uploaded uh, on a lot of places. So I recommend just doing PDF standard. That that will be fine, especially if all your images are high quality. Um, you can also do it as a PowerPoint or a JPEG or PNG if you if you need to do that. Um, and you can also you save, yeah, if you want to save each page separately, mm -hmm. you can do that also. But I would say choose it choose PDF standard. And then a lot of times, if you have a lot of stuff in this deck, it's going to be too big anyway. So you're going to want to compress your entire deck. And that is something that you can easily Google where you're going to optimize your PDF if you're using Adobe or minimize or compress. And because a lot of times if you're trying to put it up like on the ISA site, there is a place under your profile under each project for a pitch deck. So you just have to make it small enough and you can just keep compressing it, but make sure you're checking it to see, if, make sure that the quality is there. You don't want to make it so compressed that it kind of takes away some of the elements. Like if you're doing an animation deck, if you compress it too much, it kind of makes things a little squirrely. So you just have to make sure you're checking your progress. Um, but sending an email, I believe the maximum is 25 megabytes and generally if you're making a simple pitch deck it's going to be 10 or less hopefully but if it's not compress it it's not that scary you can totally do it and create a smaller version of it yeah and so here's where you can <laughs> on this page is where you can choose specific pages so you can either pick a specific page or you can type in a range so if i want pages one through five now it's downloading right um you can actually compress the size for other files like PNGs um, and then you can compress quality. But for PDF, it doesn't have that capability right now. So I would do what what Shana said and go to one of those websites. Yeah. If you have Adobe, it's a it's one of the things you can add to your um, to whatever service you have with Adobe. But there are free sites that you can pull your file into and it will compress it for you. So. You don't necessarily have to pay to do that, but it is a very smart tool because you don't want to send somebody a huge, huge, huge PDF that maybe get may get sent back to you. Yes, uh, and I think so. That do we want to move on to questions? Yeah, let's try to get through as many questions as we can. We have like thirty or so questions, so last chance to throw oh, your questions in here. Yes. <laughs> okay. I will. Can I exit this screen? Yep. Okay. Cool. Yeah, let's do that. Okay, so Caitlin and I are both going to answer these however they pop up. I'm just going to read them out and we're going to answer them and just try to get to as many as we can because I know there's just tons of questions. Okay, lookbook and mood board are similar. Yes, yes. A lookbook and mood board are generally photos only or color combinations or things that are used for visual. This is different than that. This is an elevated version of that that has text. Um, yes. Um, looking at the format, your example seems set up for viewing on screen. Is that the norm or do you want something that could be on screen or printed out? Generally, you're going to send a pitch deck over email and it's not something that you're necessarily going to print out. You don't have to not print it out, but it's not really something that you like leave behind. You're going to email it to them and they can open it on their computer in your saving ink and a lot of um, time and energy. Um, okay. Do you recommend giving more than one suggested comp actor for each main role, or do you have a, or if you have a specific actor in mind, should you only use that? That goes both ways, in my opinion. I think that for diversity's sake, I think it's great to add three or so actors um, with different nationalities, race, all of that as your character, if you're open to that. If you do have somebody specific, if you're sending it out to somebody that represents an actor and you really want them you know, involved in this, if they have a production company or whatever, just put that actor on there. Go to the ego, just do what you need to do to get them to be like, oh, this is only for me, excellent. Thank you very much, yes, I sign on. Um, Jordan is asking, can you use stock picks that are representative of your characters? I'm not sure what that means if you're talking about like a generic photo of somebody who's like an office like secretary. I would go towards more of a film still or TV still versus using a generic stock footage just because it. I think stock pictures look very commercial. What do you think, Caitlin? Yeah, I would say if it if you can't find the exact 
thing you're looking for. So say you want Selena Gomez in a secretary role or whatever it is. If you can't find that specific thing, I think you can put both on there. So have a secretary and then have her as the visual because you might not always be able to find the exact same thing you're looking for. But yeah, having the the person you envision in a film setting is better for envisioning what, what you want. But that that's my opinion on it. I don't know. Yes, I agree. I think that um, known actors are more effective than unknown actors, unless you're very specific about somebody who fits perfectly, then do both. Put that picture in there and then put a couple known actors in there. It is up to your discretion. Again, it's whatever you think works the best for your document. Um, I'm not sure exactly what the context of this is. So an actor in an older role is okay then. I think what you're asking is as a character to, if you can put older actors in. Yeah, absolutely. There's actors of all ages, put them all in there if, if that fits your character. Um, okay. Should there be a logline version of the character description? Also the type, also the type phase seem really small and difficult to read. How critical is that? Okay. So again, it's up to you. I think for characters, I want to know some juicy details about the character versus just a one-off sentence, but it's up to you. If you feel like this, listen, if you only have one sentence for your character, you should probably dig deeper. That's all I'm going to say. So I would add more. I do agree that sometimes the font is too small. So that's what you play with. You write it out, you put it in the deck, you see how small it looks. And if you want it bigger, you got to delete something so that you have more room. So that's up to you. I also made it just for to describe the font size. I made it to be viewed in full screen. So that's yeah. how I was viewing it on my computer. Um, if you're watching this on YouTube, it might be a little smaller, but you can always adjust that. Like if I knew people were only going to be seeing, like if an exec was only going to watch this on that little screen, I would probably do something different. Um, but for the sake of this one, I made it for a full screen viewing. Right. Is there a, do you think that there's a font size that's like the minimum that you should use? Is it like 10? Let for a pitch deck? I think 10 would probably be the minimum that you want to go. So on a Word document, yes. In Canva, okay. I will give you, so the text that I'm, I'm guessing they saw as being small, which is in the character descriptions, on Canva, that's a size 27.4. Right. So, yeah. So in the fonts are very different. So yes, if you that's change true. to a different font, what it looks like in that size, it's very subjective. So you kind of have to view it, that font on different screens, um, and however the person's going to be viewing it to know what to use. Yeah. Um, okay, so how do you feel about using AI to make a specific character photos or schemes if we're not so good at drawing? Um, personally, I think that if you want Selena Gomez in a police uniform and you can't find it and you can do that on AI, go for it. I don't think that there's anything wrong with using that as a tool that's effective for your deck. Just make sure it looks good. Because I know sometimes AI can make like wonky hands or things that look really weird if you're messing with it. So yeah, if, if it looks great, use it as a tool. I mean, Canva is also, they have something now called Magic Edit, which mm -hmm. is in the, when you edit. So it's where I pulled the text from in that edit photo. You can um, type in what you want and it'll do it. It's not a perfect science because it's brand new, but it is, it is AI um, production if you're looking to do that. Right. Okay, good. Um, I'm working on a pilot script that has a pitch deck. I was told last week that decks aren't carrying the weight that they used to and that a fully finished script is a necessity out of the gate. Well, I would, when to create a pitch deck, in my opinion, is sometimes you can create a pitch deck if you're pitching something. I've created pitch decks for animated series where I don't have a pilot or a whole show written out and it's a selling tool. There are other times like with a pilot that you want your pilot written and then you'll create your pitch deck as an accompanying tool for that. And again, some people are saying pitch decks are necessary and you need them for every project. Some people are being like, eh, I don't care about a pitch deck. That is person to person. That is executive to executive, producer to producer. I wouldn't listen to one person telling you that um, as an outright rule. They may be correct in the moment people in their industry or their world may not want that, but then you're going to turn around tomorrow and meet somebody else who's like, do you have a pitch deck? And if you don't have it, you're, again, it's the wild west people. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Okay, next question. Um, oh, why do I feel that the suspect slide was a bit too busy with too much information? Well, it is busy. It is busy. It's You're not wrong. Busy. <laughs> you know what it did though? It made you feel like there was a lot going on on that page. And that to me is the most important thing about a pitch tech is a feeling. Any pitch across the board, in my opinion, you have to leave the person with a feeling. If they don't feel anything, they are not going to remember you. They are not going to remember your project and they are not going to think about it the next day. That's what you want somebody to keep thinking about it. So if you're thinking about that on that suspect page, I think it was effective. Um, okay. What are pitch deck recommendations for an ensemble cast in TV or film like Friends or Armageddon? That is a great question. So for Friends, what do you think, Caitlin? Like, what would you have done if you have like an ensemble like Friends? Would you do six pages? I might. I might, or I would do them in twos mm -hmm. information. So three pages, two on each, mm -hmm. uh, and then do shorter blurbs. And I would probably use um, the colors from the logo branding for that. So I would probably do a lighter, so white backgrounds instead of black, um, and then do like the pops of color to add to like the fun. Um, and then also do like the characteristics of each people each character and how they interact with each other. Because just like the trio, if the whole thing is based around those six people, you want to know how they're going to interact with each other. Right. Yeah. It's like the one who does this, the one who does that. Um, yes. The other example was Armageddon. And I mean, I love that person for saying Armageddon because I love that movie. Um, but for that one, I would definitely do like a Bruce Willis page. I would do a Ben Affleck page. Um, and then I would do a secondary character. So I'd put Liv Tyler at, on another page with somebody else and maybe add a couple more little short descriptions. Like this is this is the guy who goes against them or whatever. I can't remember all the stuff, but you know, you just at your discretion, like who's most important on that. But you can certainly add more character pages if you really feel like they're necessary. Just don't do, don't do every single character in your entire script. Um, do you give away spoilers? I think that completely depends on the project. Um, I would give enough information that they're not discouraged by not knowing information. Um, I think it's a case by case, honestly. What do you think, Caitlin? I agree, it's a case by case. So for this one, I did do the bombshell of the first episode uh, to create, which is that Mabel knows Tim Kono. Sorry if you haven't watched the first episode, but it's very early in, it doesn't ruin the show. Um, and that way it adds some excitement, like, oh, oh, wait, 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 wait. That like makes this more complicated. She knows that person and is now investigating this. Um, so I dropped that bomb, but I didn't do the final of like who it is. Sure. I set it up, showed them who everybody's being considered so that they could maybe want to try to figure it out on their own or be like, oh, which one of these people? But I didn't do who it actually okay. Give enough information and breadcrumbs so that if you're not dropping the twist, that there's enough there to make them say, well, now I need to read it because I'm very invested in what this twist is. Just don't leave them frustrated that you're just not telling them like, oh, it's the greatest twist in the history of twists. I would never do that because you're, you're just setting yourself up for, it's not the most interesting twist of all time in the history of twists. <laughs> so yeah, just use your discretion, but um, yeah, maybe not give away the big final thing, but give away enough so they're like, wanting to read it because again the whole purpose of a pitch deck is to get them to read your script right to get that meeting so you can talk about it um okay so next question would it be one page for a movie synopsis as well so i think what they're asking is because we did a series deck would the synopsis page still be one yes unless you're giving away some information so you could do a synopsis that's two pages if it's dynamically connected that you needed one paragraph on one page and you wanted it to be big, big text, or you wanna give away information on the front and then write the twist or something on the next page and make it a big like thing. It's totally up to you, but generally, yes. Um, for series, how important is it to have a Bible in addition to a pitch deck? Can the pitch deck serve until you have enough interest that a Bible is needed? Yes, exactly. If you are writing a series, you definitely want your Bible. Um, your pitch deck is a tool to sell that project, you would generally give the Bible after you have that meeting or they're interested in the series itself. Um, okay, hi, is the landscape orientation the preferred layout? When I first started making pitch decks, I made them 
incorrectly small size, like four by three or something, just like a document size. Um, and I was told to do 16 by nine because that is cinematic and that's how you're looking at a television screen or a movie screen. So just aesthetically, yes, that is the preferred. It's not saying it's the hard and fast rule. If you're making a deck that's based on a book and you want to turn it and you want to create a book out of it and you want it to be long, do that. Um, Stranger Things is a very famous deck that was created kind of at the beginning and kind of started the whole thing. Um, that is not 16 by nine. Also, um, the guys who made Quiet Place, they did a visual pitch deck where it's videos and it's, you know, going, to, you can do that too. It, that's the great thing about a deck. It's use your discretion of whatever works best as a selling tool for your, for your um, project. Um, for color scheme for horror that you want to be eye popping, what colors would you avoid? I'm throwing that to you, Caitlin. <laughs> um, I, so it's interesting with only murders in the building because there are like horror mystery thriller elements, but it's also really funny. So um, for that, I did like the dark, I would definitely go with a darker color scheme, um, not like white and bright and airy. Uh, I went with the darker, but then I used the pops of color that to let you know that it's still kind of lighthearted and fun. Um, but like I did for this one, I would say to find a reference photo that matches like the overall feel, whether that's like, if you're like in a dark forest or an abandoned cabin or you're in a warehouse, like find that photo and then either use that dropper tool or on your own, pull the colors out of it to make, to make your thing. I mean, obviously if you're doing horror, I wouldn't do like bright pink, bright blue, like fun area. I would go with the darker theme overall. Right. Unless your killer is somebody who's like that movie, totally killer where they're set in the eighties and it's neon, then are there, I don't even know what the mask is. I always think it's like Max Hedrion, but I'm not sure that it's Max Hedrion. But you know, like if, if you're talking about a time era, then, you know, use those pops of color so that you can yeah. keep it in. Yeah. Okay. How many slides is normal for a series slash limited series pitch deck? Okay. So this is a good question because we didn't actually cover pages. For a film, I think it's less. And I would say 10 is kind of a good place to be. For series, I think you can go a little bit longer, like 13, 14, depending on how much information or how many characters or different things that you need to, to show. Um, but I think going over 15 is too much for a deck, just in general. I, I've seen successful decks that are 20 pages, 25 pages, but to me, it's too long. So unless you're an established person who's making this and there's a purpose for it, I would try to keep it tight and short. I also think it depends on like what you have on the pages, because if it is 14 pages of full text like that, it's like watching a teacher give a PowerPoint presentation that you're like, oh, my God, like, when is this going to be done? Right. Um, so think of it. <laughs> think of it that way. Like if you have pages like I had that page with the board with all the different people people are probably gonna stare at it for a little, but they're not gonna have to read a whole thing, which gives you time to make another page with actual text on it. Yes, um, good good call on that. Uh, please answer this when you are finished with your Canva tutorial. Yes, yes, Barry, we're going to. Would one automate this presentation, add music and produce an MP4? So this is something that to me totally depends on your project. If you're doing a musical, yes, create a movie out of it, add some music. Add things on, you can add things on Canva like music that plays on a page. And I'll let Caitlin talk about that. But yes, create, have your deck version that's your PDF, but also you can create another version that adds music or adds whatever you want. We did a deck, me and my partner did a deck for an animated series, and we added a little button that you could listen to the main character talk because my writing partner is also a voiceover artist. So we did a little reading of parts of the script to hear the voice of the character. So yeah, do play, do what you want. Yeah, I think if I had done season three of Only Murders in the Building, I probably would have used music with it because it's based around a musical theatrical production. Um, so I think having music there would have added if you're presenting in person or even if someone's just watching it. Um, but in Canva, the same place where you find photos, so when you type something in, um, it'll also generate videos and music for you. And those are all like royal, everything in there is royalty free. Um, and then you can also upload your own music just by dragging and dropping it in. Cool. Um, Jim is asking, maybe weird question, 
there's no weird questions. They're all viable. Okay, I'm working with a storyboard artist I know for my series pitch deck. All are illustrations a good choice for a live action series or would they imply animation? Um, we talked about this before, but I do think if you're gonna use storyboard images, that's totally fine as long as you just label them like story potential storyboards. That's totally fine. If you feel like that's an important aspect and you really love it, put it in there. It shows your passion and it shows your dedication to this story and what you would do. If, if you're a director on it too and you want to attach yourself, yeah, go for it. But if it if you if if it will make it seem like if you have a weird drawing that you're putting in there and it's going to make it seem like it's half animated, half live action, that can be confusing. So yeah, use the question. Yeah. I mean, it could be fun aesthetically if you did a page that had, like if you were showing your character doing something, you put it on the character page with a live action picture. I don't know, you could have fun with it. I think that there's no rule against it. Just make sure that it's, that they know what the rules are of your story. Um, okay, next question. At what point do you need a pitch deck? So we talked about this at the top, but I'll reiterate again. A pitch deck is used at any point. You can use, you can create a pitch deck before you write to get kind of your ideas in a row. You have a pitch deck after you finish your, your project. Um, it is used either before you're verbally pitching, after you're verbally pitching as a way to see if somebody's interested in talking to you. It can be a takeaway document that you leave after you talk to somebody about your project. It's across the board used in a lot of different ways. Next question. How much does it cost to create a pitch deck in Canva? Depends. Are you using the premium version? If not, zero dollars. Um, and you can also use Canva. But you can buy individually those pictures if you want. If there's if you don't want to pay for it, but there's one that has a little crown, you can buy each one individually. It just might add up more than what it would cost you for the month. Yeah. So in worst case scenario, if you buy photos, the cost of those. And then if you get Canva, I think it's twelve ninety nine a month. Uh, like everything keeps going up, so, but it, I believe it's twelve ninety nine a month. So it's it's not a lot. Obviously, if you like have someone else do it, um, I don't know the current going rate, but within Canva, between zero and twelve dollars. <laughs> right. And again, what we were talking about is if you want to initially start your deck and then you feel really confident about everything in it, but you need it like zhuzhed up, you want a little bit of of pizzazz and sparkle to it you can always then hire somebody to do that kind of like pizzazzy stuff that you don't know how to do and that's an option also so that will save you money if you don't feel like you have the skills to make it as spectacular as you want you can lay it all out and then be like can you make this prettier <laughs> which is what i do sometimes i'm like i also do that a lot <laughs> people send me a poster and be like mm, i don't like this and then they just send me the canva file and i fix it right Exactly. And it's cheaper than them putting the whole thing together for you. Yeah. Okay. Um, Cece, we only have a couple more questions. We're going to get through these. Cece is asking, well, first she says, this is incredibly helpful. Thank you so much, Cece. We appreciate that. Is there a holy grail site for pitch decks that tracks the latest, greatest in decks and provides examples of good, bad decks? Many thanks to all. I wish there was, or, and we wouldn't have to do this conversation. <laughs> um, no, That's there is so not. Funny. But you can ask friends to take a look at their decks you can reach out to us if you're looking at ISA, if you're part of our world, which you are if you're here. You can always, you know, reach out and be like, I'm looking for an example of this, a horror deck or something like that. And generally, we can probably provide you an example. Um, but not everyone asks that because if you can get them from people, you know, that's the easiest and best way. Uh, do you have to clarify the actors pictured are not attached to the project? I think at the beginning of pitch decks, that was something that was done. But I think now everyone knows the rules that these people are not attached. On the reverse, if they are attached to your project, absolutely mark them attached. Like that would be the only thing I would say you need to label if they are attached. Put that on there. What do you think? Is that true, Kaylin? Yeah, I believe in what in what I've seen. And now with the age of the internet of like everybody having access to everything, a lot of things are like if they are involved in this, either tag them or mention them. If not... People know what they're for and that you're using this to envision your character. Yes, exactly. Um, curious, how long did it take you, Caitlin, to make this pitch deck? Also, on average, how long does it take to make one? Um, okay, so I wouldn't use how long it took me. To be honest with you, I wouldn't use how long it took me because I use Canva every single day and like click, click, click through the whole thing. Um, I think if I was not being very particular about it, I think this would have taken me two hours but 
I really love this show. <laughs> so I like really when it, I like, I fixed it a lot. So I think in total, probably like three and a half, four hours for the whole thing. Yeah. Um, I would, I would not listen to Caitlin about making pitch decks because she is quite frankly an expert. When I make a pitch deck, there's, there's three parts to it. One, I write all the information down as best I can. So then I can plug that in and I build the pages very, very basically and put all the information in and try to just pull some pictures and try to figure out colors and stuff. That will probably take me three hours to do that. Aside from writing, which is a totally different beast. So I'm not including the writing. But if you pull it in and you play with it, give yourself a couple hours, walk away from it, come back and start working on details, making things look pretty. Then again, that will take another couple of hours. It could take five hours. It could take a couple different times of four hours each. I don't know. It depends. Uh, then walk away from it again, come back, get some other eyes on it and do some little tweaks of what's not working, what's redundant. Cause again, you don't want to double up on stuff. So it depends. I mean, I would say absolutely do not try to do this in one setting, one no. setting. because I, I texted Shana yesterday. I was like, I cannot look at this anymore. I need to step away because you get so like in your head about what's on there. So I yeah. think giving yourself an extended period of time and knowing Sometimes you just need to walk away and then, which I did with the first and second page because I did not like them. And when I came back, I was like, oh, a podcast page for the log line, like got a new idea. So you definitely have to like give yourself more time to do and it. Be prepared for feedback and for changing things because the way that you see it in your head and you're putting it on the page doesn't necessarily translate to somebody who doesn't know about your project. So that's why it's always good. Same with script to send it out to your reliable sources, send it out and get their very honest feedback about what's working, what's not working, what they like and what isn't working, and then go back and edit it again. That's really important. Don't just think one time you're done and send it out because a lot of times it'll be flat. It's not gonna look good on the page. The colors are gonna kind of be like, ah, oh, could you tweak that? It doesn't really match the tone, that kind of thing. So just give yourself a lot of grace, especially if you're new to this. Give yourself a lot of room to play and give yourself a lot of permission to mess up because you're never going to get something great. You know, if you think the first time on the, on the page or Canva is going to be perfect, just like a script. Um, okay. So a couple more working on a feature composed of three distinct vignettes with same characters. Do you recommend each vignette synopsis on its, on one page or all together? I mean, me personally, I, if you're, if it's a vignette and that's sort of the engine of the whole thing, I would do eat a page for each vignette. Yeah, I would, I would too. That sounds really fun, honestly. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Ooh, that's yeah. awesome. Like if they're, if they're completely different, like setting those different worlds and environments, I think that's kind of fun. I would. Yeah. Especially that. if they have the same act, same characters, that's a really yeah. fun way to visually show that, that the same characters are in the different tones or aesthetics of each thing. That's really cool. Um, okay. Next one. What image would you look for? What image would you look for a romance comedy drawing blanks here? Not quite sure, but romantic comedies are generally couples or somebody who is like a, maybe you want a before and after. Like if somebody's a big hot mess at the beginning and then they find themselves, maybe the beginning of your deck needs to be a little bit like your character's messy. And then maybe your final image is of, of a couple or, yeah, somebody, you know, I don't know. You just have to, yeah, think about. I think like defining characteristics, like you said, like messy or like a defining moment in it. Yeah. So like say they met at like a diner or something like that. I would probably type in like couple at diner and then like try to match the vibe of that. But I think you kind of have to have that idea in mind or that plot in characters drawn out in mind to be able to find that photo. Because if you don't know what you're looking for, you're not going to find it. Yes. Um, okay, so cool. Uh, <laughs> what are some common mistakes people make in creating pitch decks, things that would immediately turn a producer away? Low res photos is one. If your deck is too long with just text on every page where it's pretty much like a Bible. Um, what else, Caitlin? I'm trying to think. Um, sorry, I was just looking. Felicity said that you have a meeting now. So <laughs> <laughs> I think we're almost at the end of this thing. Um, but, uh, <laughs> Oh, there it is. Um, so I would say, um, yeah, having things like not matching at all, all different, because then it kind of looks like you don't really know what your story is. Like you want it to be very defined, like 
this is the vibe, this is the world, this is what it is. So I think if it's kind of all over the place, it's not gonna, yeah. it's not really professionally done. Same way as like bad photos aren't gonna look yeah. well done. Too many fonts, too many colors, too much text, too much of anything is not good. Make it refined. Um, and yes, Felicity, I will be right there. I will jump on the meeting. I might be two minutes late. Okay, last question we're going to get to. Um, I did a deck in PowerPoint adding music that played through all pages, but I could only send it as a link to my drive. Is that something Canva can do? Okay, so if you're trying to use music, so I guess I'd have to know inform more information. If it was music from PowerPoint. So Canva, you can download it as an MP4. Um, which is how you would download something with music most likely. Because if you're playing something with music, people are probably going to be watching it rather than clicking through it. Um, I personally have never tried doing it. I don't believe a PDF has the capability to have the music. I think you would have to download it as either the PowerPoint or as an MP4 and then load it to your drive. Right. I think maybe also it could be that it's too large. So it's automatically sending a link to your drive. I'm not sure. Yeah. So I'm yeah. not sure about compressing with music. I, I'm not, I don't know the answer to that, but um, do you, I love that you're adding music, and stuff. but I don't think, it's a, I don't think it's a, a no for somebody opening something that links. I just think you have to be careful. You have to know the person and they have to trust you. No one's going to open your deck no matter what, if they don't know you're unsolicited, do not send these things unsolicited. No one's going to open them. They're just going to delete. So I'll yes. Don't send it if it's still processing because <laughs> Google Drive likes to take forever. So if it's something like an MP4, it's going to take hours to process. And if you send it to someone immediately, they're just going to get a thing that says this video is not done processing. Right. And don't do yes. that. Yes. <laughs> And as JRM Super Soldier 2024 said, MP4s are too large. Yes. So it may link it to a drive or you could download it and put a, do a Wii transfer or something like that if it's too large. Um, but yes, thank you all so much. Um, I have to go, obviously, to a meeting. Thank you, Felicity. But uh, we are here if you guys want to do more deep dives into the pitch decks, if you want to do one-on-ones, if you want to do a class that you bring your deck and we work out some details of like how to make it better, we are open to that. Just email both of us or one of us, whoever you like better, and then we'll count who has the most emails um, and, and we'll set that up. So thank you all for being here. We really appreciate you and all of your questions and we will see you soon.